Chair of the Party, I'm happy to welcome you all here today. I'm going to have a very interesting debate about him. <laughs> great graphic, really about it, great graphic. Were Greenspan's policy success or failure? I'm going to introduce the alumni board judges, and Nathan Nichols and Nathan will then introduce the debaters. Our judges today, we're very happy to have them here, Barbara Sparks. successful chairman in the Fed's 92-year history. He presided over an era of low inflation rates, low unemployment, and the longest economic expansion in U.S. history, in, in the U.S. history, with a decade of uninterrupted growth from March 1991 to March 2001. According to a former Fed board member, Lyle uh, Granley, uh, he says that he was the first e economist in the U.S. to perceive what was happening. Now, during uh, Greenspan's 18 and a half years in office, there were only two uh, recessions. The first was in 1990 to 1991, which was during an oil price spike after Iraq invaded Kuwait. The second was in 2001, uh, after the, during the aftermath of the steep plunge um, in stock prices in the previous year. Both of these were only mild downturns, but, and they only lasted three months each. Now, if you look at that and compare it to the 18 years uh, before Greenspan took over, um, the country uh, experienced four severe downturns. Now, if you compare these together, you can see that during Greenspan's term, the country has done fairly well. Inflation rates uh, in 1979 were as high as 13.3 percent. This was during Volcker's term. And this was during the, a decade of oil shocks with an average of 8.4%. Inflation was at 3.4% in 2005, near you know, a year before uh, Greenspan's term ended. And even though the country was hit by another oil surge, 
the that pushed uh, gasoline prices at three dollars per gallon. You know, inflation rates were fairly low, uh, and this is a chart just showing um, the different prices of oil during different um, periods, during different years, from a little bit before '76 to 2012. Now, Greenspan says that he was merely building up, building upon the inflation gains made by Volcker. He credits factors such as globalization and deregulation of U.S. industries for setting the stage for the country's prosperity. He was faulted for failing to restrain the high climbing stock markets in 1996. Um, for the, for, I'm sorry, he was faulted for failing to restrain the high climbing stock markets. And in 1996, he wondered whether the investors uh, could be in the grip of irrational exuberance, but prices kept climbing. When the bubble burst, he moved to contain the damage by lowering, lowering interest rates. Now, everyone knows that the Fed can drive interest rates lower by pumping more money into the economy. Uh, this does not follow, however, that interest rates were so. Th this doesn't follow that, that that's why interest rates were so low in the early 2000s. Other factors affected interest rates as well. For example, a sudden increase in savings will drive down interest rates. Such a shift did occur, according to Greenspan, because there was a surge in savings from other countries. Although he mainly names, um, he only names China, some of the Middle Eastern oil producing countries were also responsible for much of this new savings. Now, if you shift the supply curve to the right, the price falls. And in this case, the price of savings and lending is the interest rate. Because of this, savings rate was negative for two years. Now, how do we know that it was an increase in savings, not an increase in the money supply that caused interest rates to fall. Well, look at the money supply. The annual growth rate of the monetary base, the magnitude over which the Fed has the most control, fell from 10% in 2001 to 5% in 2006. Furthermore, nearly all of the growth in the monetary base went into the currency, went into currency, an increasing proportion of which is held abroad. Now, Greenspan's argument defending his policies are two folds. The first one is that the Fed, Fed controls overnight interest rates, but not long-term interest rates, and the whole mortgage rates driven by them. The second is that a global excess of savings was the presumptive cause of the worldwide decline in long-term rates. Furthermore, if the Fed was the cause of all this, why was the housing bubble worldwide? Do Greenspan's critics seriously think that the Fed was responsible for high housing prices in, let's say, Spain? Well, Greenspan states that it was a failure to properly price such risky assets that precipitated in this crisis. Thank you very much, and I would like to welcome uh, my teammate, Martin. Thank you, sir. It is the government, not Alan Greenspan, that is responsible for today's economic downturn. The chairman of the Federal Reserve is forced to work in conjunction with the government in order to stabilize the economy, and is therefore not solely to blame for any economic crisis. During the Great Depression, the Federal Reserve was responsible for monetary contraction because prohibitive regulations on lending stopped them from, from providing liquidity to the market. Today, the Federal Reserve's hands were tied by a lack of fiscal restraint on the part of the Bush administration. Without cooperation from the government, Alan Greenspan could not have hoped to stem the out-of-control credit by himself. The current recession cannot be attributed to a lack of monetary policy aptitude. Rather, in this case, a lack of fiscal foresight negatively influenced the actions of the Federal Reserve. The current recession was not exacerbated or even caused by a lack of experience in the Federal Reserve. Alan Greenspan was the Federal Reserve Chairman during the administrations of four presidents, and until the last administration had cooperation in lowering deficits and keeping the economy healthy. The government's deficit in 2008 was $400 billion, a stark contrast to the $230 billion surplus generated by the economic activities of the Clinton administration. Deficit spending during times of economic growth has a crowding out effect on investment. If the government borrows too much money, real interest rates rise, and eventually private investors are crowded out of the money, money lending market. This happened in early 2001 when large tax cuts warranted an increase in the issuance of bonds 
to fund the government. The government's overutilization of the lending markets hindered the Federal Reserve's ability to affect long-term interest rates, and therefore their ability to properly fix the economy. This graph shows the national debt as a percentage of GDP since World War II. It clearly shows that since World War II, only three presidencies have allowed the national debt to increase as a percentage of GDP. The Reagan and Bush, both Bush administrations have both ran up impressive debts, which in turn require more borrowing to pay off interest on those debts. Approaching the year 2009, debt as a percentage of GDP skyrockets. At that time, Alan Greenspan had to ensure that private investors had easy access to capital while also combating inflation. The increased borrowing on the part of the government made combating inflation and keeping interest rates low difficult. In addition to being hindered by inflexible long-term interest rates, the Federal Reserve under Alan Greenspan was forced to deal with the devastating effects of September 11. Critics say that Greenspan, critics saying that Greenspan kept interest rates too low, overlooked the fact that the Federal Reserve was tasked early on with preserving, reversing the sprawling damage done to the markets by the attack on the World Trade Center. In a report to Congress, the Congressional Research Service confirmed through their observations that, quote, over the long run, 9-11 will adversely affect U.S. productivity growth because resources, um, because resources are, are being and will be used to ensure the security of production, distribution, finance, and communication. The, sub the subsequent wars that stemmed from 9-11 increased the government's debt as well as the costs of global trade hindering productivity at home. Given the state of global affairs at the turn of the century and the economic pitfalls those affairs carried with them, the Federal Reserve had a legitimate concern about raising interest rates too early. Had the government cooperated with the Federal Reserve, there may have been a chance to ebb the imminent economic crisis by using interest rate hikes in conjunction with conservative fiscal spending. The Federal Reserve began raising interest rates five years ago to responsibly prevent the economy from expanding out of control. However, as the Federal Reserve sought to engage in contracting the economy, government spending increased over that period. What the historic budget deficit of the last eight years has caused is an enormous bubble in the housing and financial sectors of the economy, which eventually led to catastrophic collapse. Though the Fed tried to cool down the economy over the last five years, the fiscal policies that promoted uncontrolled growth and accumulation of debt set the stage for a recession earlier than the Federal Reserve was ever able to react. Thank you. And I would like to introduce my colleague, Jacob. It's often thought that Alan Greenspan and bankers' loose credit policies have caused the credit bubble. But I'd like to argue against this. I think that there's a global glut in savings that actually caused the credit bubble. Often it is taught that savings that one should save over their lifetime, and this will lead to more wealth. I disagree with this. There is such thing as saving too much. Um, the usually, the, in a simple ISLM framework, when one saves, this means that they're buying bonds, and when they buy more bonds, this increases their price and lowers the interest rate. The lowering of the interest rate increases the incentive to, to invest because there's lower interest rates and people won't want to uh, invest in bonds anymore. In today's global financial world, capital can, flu can flow um, anywhere at quick speeds and, and, and in many countries. This kind of removes this ISLM framework because over many countries, say for example, a country can decide that it might want to um, invest its savings abroad, as in China, they can send their savings to the United States, and that's not, um, and that in turn does not allow them to lower the interest rate in that country because they're not buying bonds in, in China. Uh, many countries that do this, such as China and Japan and the OPEC nations, are sending their excess savings to the U.S. Here's an example of the foreign holders of the United States Treasury Secretary's uh, securities. Um, China's the largest holder. They currently have around 780 billion. Uh, and Japan's second, and uh, OPEC nations and the Caribbean uh, are third and fourth. The Caribbean's kind of interesting. It's usually that's actually offshore banks. Um, but uh, Americans' low saving and high consumption offsets foreigners' high savings and low consumption. This results in a trade deficit 
because our increased income from savings coming into the country raises our imports. This is unsustainable. The only way to offset this uneven balance is to encourage foreign domestic consumption. But as we know, control over foreign affairs is very difficult. Here's a graph showing the rate of change in, in um, U.S. debt, uh, looking at the marketable securities and the foreign holders of debt. As, and as you can see, um, basically throughout this whole period, um, foreign holders have increased their, their consumption of U.S. debt. Why do countries send their excess savings here is a big question. Well, there's a lot of reasons. One being that government policies dictate a lot of the savings coming to the U.S. As in the case of China, they have a trade surplus with us that's, that's rather large. It's over $200 billion, And it's been growing every year for the past 10 years. And um, they have all these excess dollars, and the government sends their dollars over to the U.S. because their currency, the yuan, is fixed to the dollar. So they must keep their currency undervalued in order, that's part of their, their policies, to make their exports more competitive is to keep the yuan undervalued towards the dollar. So they have to buy more and more treasuries to be able to do this. So that's sending more and more dollars to, to the United States that otherwise wouldn't be sent here without this government policy. So in, in a sense, this government policy is augmenting the, the normal flows of the financial system. Also, a lot of savings come here from other countries that don't have developed capital markets or that have unsustainable capital markets. And here in the United States, our capital markets are developed and rather dependable, except for recently. Um, also, the investment opportunities are abundant and the legal protections are very solid. So a lot of people want to invest here in the United States as opposed to other countries, believe it or not. And um, so a lot of people, like a lot of OPEC nations, like in Saudi Arabia, or Abu Dhabi, they send their savings over to the United States to buy stocks and bonds. Um, also, the relative safety of U.S. Treasury bills and U.S. dollars reserve currency status is huge in deciding where savings flow. So all in all, there's really not much to do about this global savings flood. So you can't really completely blame Alan Greenspan for this. Um, it's largely out of our control. When foreigners decide to save, um, we cannot really tell them to save less because we don't have any control over that. Um, we have tried some different policies. We've tried to tell China that they should trade the, change their trade and monetary policy, but that hasn't worked, that has been very successful because they have a, they have a mission and we have a mission and um, it's, it doesn't really work. We've gone as far as to call them a currency manipulator, but that hasn't been successful. Um, and so, um, the only options to protect the U.S. were extremely protectionist, and they just said it, it wasn't going to be sustainable. And now for the next group. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jonathan Santiago, and I will be arguing about the derivative market under Greenspan. Greenspan once said that the true measure of a successful career is to be able to be content, even proud, that you succeeded through your own endeavors without leaving a trail of casualties in your wake. In using his own definition of a successful career, Alan Greenspan's tenure as Fed Chairman can only be corrected, correctly deemed a failure. It is sometimes said in his defense that he could not have foreseen or controlled the problems we are currently facing. I beg to differ. 
Evidence proves that Greenspan consciously chose a set of policies which led to current financial crisis. As Greenspan himself said, the past is prologue. I argue that Greenspan's actions played a major role in creating a financially unsustainable culture of greed on Wall Street. He consistently advocated that the best means of obtaining a profit was by merely sweeping risk under the rug. Greenspan once said, and I quote, it is precisely the greed of the businessman or his profit-seeking motive which is the unexcelled protector of the consumer. As we are witnessing today, nowhere was this less true than in the derivative market. Now let me define derivatives for you. Derivatives are financial contracts or instruments whose value are acquired from the value of something else. They can be used to reduce the risk of economic losses arising from changes in the value of that something else. This is known as hedging, or as I like to call it, hiding risk by spreading it. On the other hand, derivatives can be used by investors to repay profit if the value of that something else moves in an expected direction. For example, picture someone betting on whether or not you win your next hand in blackjack. This person is taking a risk on whether or not you lose that hand. Essentially, this was being done with life insurances and mortgage bank securities. This practice is called speculation, a risky action which is clearly not always 100% accurate. Since the value of a derivative is dependent on another value, its true value isn't necessarily always seen on the books. Derivatives involve various elaborate entities which I have only begun to explain, though the potential dangers they carry are quite evident. Frank Partnoy, economics professor at the University of San Diego and an expert on financial regulation, notes that derivatives are a centerpiece of the crisis, and Greenspan was the leading proponent of the deregulation of derivatives. Other experts agree that derivatives are dangerous financial instruments. Warren Buffett, America's most famous investor, called these derivatives financial weapons of mass destruction. He claimed that these derivatives contracts contain dormant losses that will eventually backfire on their owners. Insurance companies and banks were particularly affected by this kind of action. It was only a matter of time before the rug was pulled out from underneath. When the derivative market began in the mid-1990s, the transactions were simpler, more transparent affairs. As the market grew, or more appropriately exploded, from $631 billion in 2000 to $46 trillion by the first half of 2007, both transactions and the financial instruments, financial instruments themselves became much more complex. Where was the supervision? Where was the regulation? Some argue that Greenspan could only control so much. In reality, Greenspan was not helpless, as dangerous derivatives took control of financial markets. Evidence proves that Greenspan ignored the risk and even promoted the revenues. Alan Blinder, a former Federal Reserve Board member and an economist at Princeton University, proposed that, Greens that proposals to bring even minimalist regulation were basically rebuffed by Greenspan. He then adds that Greenspan was consistently cheerleading on the derivatives. Greenspan told the Senate Banking Committee in 2003, what we have found over the years in the marketplace is that derivatives have been an extraordinarily, extraordinarily useful vehicle to transfer risk from those who shouldn't be taking it to those who are willing and capable of doing so. He went on to add, and I quote, it would be a mistake to more deeply regulate the contracts. This unquestioned faith in what Greenspan called the power of unbridled financial innovation stands as one of the biggest errors. Greenspan had the ability to regulate derivatives yet he chose to promote rather than control these financial weapons of mass destruction. In conclusion, Greenspan's fondness of Wall Street, what he called America's persecuted minority, led to a financial market built of cards. And I'd like to introduce now my colleague, Anita Maneri. Any discussion on Alan Greenspan's effect on the financial crisis requires analysis of the money and credit expansion. Recent episodes of financial crises and recession of the global economy have common patterns. In most cases, a country initially benefits from extended supplies of base money and new money which are created from credit liberalization. The financial sector expands as it increasingly captures profits. The banking system is well capitalized and able to expand credit. Assets increase in monetary value and interest rates are low. This wealth effect encourages consumption, borrowing, and business investment. 
I will argue that this boom, based on irrational exuberance, was both created and destroyed by Greenspan's monetary policy. Greenspan asserts that budget deficits and excessive money growth raise long-term interest rates and thus harm social interest. Greenspan is indeed right. He chose to ignore his own views by pumping so much money into the economy that a crash was inevitable. By viewing graphically the unsustainable trend in interest rates selected by Greenspan, I will clearly show how Greenspan's policy artificially created an economic bubble. My colleague will then make the final step in our overall argument to prove that Greenspan's credit policies failed to be sustainable. In his Wall Street Journal article from March 11, 2009, Greenspan rejects the idea that the Fed's low interest rate policy between December 2000 and June 2004 fueled the housing bubble, which in turn laid the foundation for the current crisis. I want to remind you that the federal funds rate was lowered from 6.5% in December 2000 to 1% by June 2003, and it was kept at 1% until June 2004. To understand Greenspan's policy's contribution to today's economic crisis, we need to understand the importance of interest rates and how the Federal Reserve is able to affect interest rates through money supply. As we can see in the graph provided uh, by the Fed, the constant increase in money supply is followed by the constant decrease in interest rates. It is evident that the credit expansionary policy lowers the rate of interest. In addition, the slow interest rates are matched by lower savings, as shown in the next graph. Furthermore, consumption rises as savings falls, and consumers are able to keep up their high consumption patterns while relying on easy credit. At the same time, the increase in money supply and decrease in interest rate triggers more investment. This abundant injection of credit into the system creates the illusion of increasing savings as, as seen by the entrepreneurs. In this way, entrepreneurs are pushed into further investments, as the graph shows, despite savings reaching negative levels. However, in the long run, entrepreneurs will depend on this now elusive savings, and when there are actually no savings, the system collapses. In an interview, Greenspan said that global forces beyond the control of the Federal Reserve had kept long-term interest rates low, fueling the housing bubble earlier this decade. Not all economists are ready to accept the above statement. On Greenspan's monetary policy, Harvard economic professor Kenneth Rogoff says, if you cut interest rates when asset prices are in free fall, then when asset prices are, are rising while indebtedness is rising all over the country, you need to raise interest rates. He actually chose not to do that. Lee Hoskins, former chairman of the Cleveland Fed, says that to find partial causes of the credit turmoil, you have to go back to Fed's decision to push the federal funds rate down to 1% and leave it there for over a year. In the midst of an international economic recession and the attempt of solving the economic crisis, more attention is given to the cure than the cause. However, soon people will look for answers to questions concerning the causations of such a recession. It is very possible that we might be among the ones providing those answers. If asked what caused the recent recession, I will have a short story to narrate. I will call it the disaster story. I will tell how consumers and entrepreneurs borrowed too much and saved too little. Eventually, the ones who didn't save did not have any money to buy what the people who borrowed had produced. That resulted in bankruptcies, unemployment, and the infamous housing bubble. Why did they borrow too much and save too little? because interest rates were too low. In addition, the people who borrowed too much couldn't earn enough to pay back the lenders who managed to save, because the savers did not save enough to pay for what the borrowers produced. Why did the savers not save enough and the borrowers borrowed too much? Because interest rates were not high enough. Finally, it is important to recognize that low interest rates are necessary for the jump-starting of the economy, and that is what Greenspan did. However, once the economy is growing, these interest rates need to rise in order to slow down a booming economy before it collapses. And that is what Greenspan ignored. I would like to welcome my colleague Harrison Sears. Hello. The Federal Reserve, under the care of the so-called maestro Alan Greenspan, undertook a policy of easy money, low interest rates, and unrestrained credit inflation that naturally culminated in the depression we see around us today. Without a doubt, the policies just mentioned resulted in a market that, though its short-term growth seemed phenomenal, was inherently unstable in the long run. 
As I'll prove in a few minutes, Greenspan's chronically low interest rates triggered a boom bust business cycle in which the consumers overconsume and entrepreneurs malinvest because of artificial market conditions. The cycle begins with the process of injecting money, ex nihilo, into the markets in order to thrust down the rate of interest. I must admit, though, I'm a particular fan of the term ex nihilo. <laughs> it's usually a term used by religions to describe the act of God creating the world out of nothing. However, it is apt to describe this is Greenspan's credit inflation as well. Along these lines, Congressman Ron Paul noted in February 2000, <coughs> addressing Greenspan's inflation, that the last quarter of 1999 might be a historic high for an increase in Fed credit. Over the last three years, the, the Fed has not been in target range for M3. In fact, it went over by six times in 90 billion. Now, so remind you, every more of the ridiculous growth in the money supply, a graph that the opposing team didn't bother showing you, supply that Greenspan presided over since becoming Federal Reserve Chairman in 1987. The response to monetary policies, I think not. Returning again once to business, to business cycle theory, that influx of money hit the market, emasculates the savings, and proceeds to lower the rate of interest, as proven just prior by my colleagues in Egypt. This will then signal to entrepreneurs that there's a lot of investments, that there's a lot of savings out there for investments. Again, it's proven. proven. And consumers will be paid less to save. They will decide to consume in the short run, and this will change their consumption preferences. And the entrepreneur, because he has a lot of investments to make, will proceed to invest in structure production in order in order to satiate the high demand, the, no, sorry, he will invest in the structure production in order to satiate the consumer's preferences. For instance, by building many retail stores while the demand for consumer goods is high. However, all of these investments are made in boom era, ergo unsustainable conditions and are hence malinvestments. Eventually, Greenspan did end the rate of low interest rates. And once this happened, a bust was inevitable. When injections of new money ceased entering the economy, the pool of savings, which had been bolstered during the boom, returned not only to their, to their pre-inflationary levels, but to an even lower one, because consumers had simply decided to consume more and to save less during that time. As a result, many of the investments planned by entrepreneurs were not able to be finished because of the funds were simply not in existence, and must have either been entirely liquidated or extremely downsized. The contraction of credit also severely hurt banks, many of which had lent far more money during the boom period than they had, had during the period of credit inflation, and it lent risky loans to individuals. Many banks like Northern Rock, whose bank run in 2007 is pictured, and countless banks on Wall Street could no longer stay in business without massive government intervention. Consumers were also affected because while many of them had gotten easy loans during the boom period while easy money was throughout the economy, once the credit contracted, they found out that they could no longer pay off their loans, so they decided to default on all of those. Once again, the banks here, they were already far too, they already had far too months, they'd already not been able to sustain their investments, were even hit harder because people were now defaulting. However, most of the damage is done in the structure of production because while the now investments were made during boom period conditions, and because of that boom period aiming at safety and conditions there, once they changed, the entrepreneurs needed service consumer demand during the bus period. So it's requiring a recession as the economy falls below its capacity while they are reorganizing the structure of production. In conclusion, while Greenspan's policies result in a period of short-term growth, by their very nature they result in a boom bust business cycles whose economic disintegration we see around today. Now as I wrap up, I'd like to quote Meister himself, straight out of Ayn Rand's 1966, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. The excess credit which the, federal, which the Fed pumped into the economy spilled over into the stock market, triggering a fantastic speculative boom. It's quite a shame, though, that Greenspan could not apply the lessons he so easily saw in the past to his tenure as Federal Reserve Chairman. I would like to now invite the battles from the opposing team.
The team states, you know, that Wingspan could have done a lot to basically um, prevent the crisis from happening. Um, and, for example, regulate, you know, better regulate the, you know, the market. But Wingspan was, you know, elected sort of like a deregulator. Um, he didn't believe in a regulated market. He believed in... Um, capitalist market, where basically the mar the market operates on its own without much of much help from the government. Now, if he goes in and tries to regulate, tries to do different things to help it out, it's totally against his belief. And if it's against his belief, I mean, why would you do something that's against your belief? You're gonna try to do everything you can to to go the right path by you know. By no, you try, you're, you're trying to do everything you can to, to head in the right direction, but you're not trying to do something that you think is wrong, which he believed that um, regulated markets are wrong. And if, for example, look at the bailout plan now. Um, everyone thought that the Fed, you know, was insane for helping out banks. If he did that 15 years ago, what would people have thought then? You know. So I mean, we. We look at the seven hundred, what is the seven hundred uh, billion dollar um, stimulus plan, and what was everyone's reaction to that? Like, was Obama insane? You know, that was the initial reaction. It didn't pass the first time. Um, and and if if the, if the Fed tried to put this idea, it, this idea to the government um, for them to do something like this, it wouldn't have flied. It would you know it wouldn't have flown. <laughs> you know, so. It just, it just couldn't happen. He did already. He did what he had to do, and at the time, it was, it was the best action to take. Um, now, he does state that his free market beliefs were flawed. He, do, he does state that. But if this is the case, then capitalism is flawed. And if capitalism is flawed, then what, what, you know, what market system should we use? That, that's the other question. Like, what's, what's the other option? Um, and that's all I have. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'd like to respond to the opposing side's arguments. Uh, first, by saying that um, the, uh, the uh, calls for regulation from Alan Greenspan, personally. And this is the person we're talking about. Um, this debate is actually about Alan Greenspan. Uh, and you could go so far as to argue not even the institution of the Federal Reserve. So this asking for him to regulate things like derivatives, complex financial instruments, regulate the housing market, regulate demand from ordinary individuals or corporations, all these things are not his job. His job as the chairman of the Federal Reserve is to regulate banks, acting as the central bank of the United States of America. I mean, the financial tools that the Federal Reserve has to use all involve the money supply. He can raise the reserve requirements for the different banks. He can change the federal funds rate, the overnight lending rate. But historically, the Federal Reserve has never been in charge of regulating these different practices between corporations and between individuals. Uh, to ask that of him, especially in the past, maybe not now when we're restructuring our different financial uh, regulatory institutions, uh, is not a very strong argument to say that he was responsible for this recession. Also, uh, saying that Alan Greenspan fueled the housing bubble is also not entirely true. Uh, though lowering interest rates does stimulate investment, uh, it also stimulates housing purchases, uh, it was really the financial instruments that were invented at that period of time that caused this, this easy availability of uh, mortgages. 
um, subprime mortgages were invented during his, uh, his tenure as the Federal Reserve Chairman. Um, and the, so these are a relatively new invention, and they have very little to do with the Federal Reserve's actions. Um, there are already government institutions in place like the SEC or the FDIC that, that work on the finer aspects of the economy, whether it be in the stock market or within the banks. And if you look at these institutions, uh, many people who have done, you know, closely observed the economy and not just looked at it on a very broad level at the highest level, which is the Federal Reserve monetary policy, um, have shown that these institutions were also not very active in containing these things when it was actually their job to do that. Thank you. Now, uh, Jacob. <laughs> I guess I'll use it. <laughs> so, as Harrison said, Greenspan isn't a god. So that means that he's not an essence, and that means he's not the all-determining one of credit. So I think what, what they're really missing is actually that there's a lot, of, a lot of actors in this process. All those bankers, all the regulations, what about other, all the other regulatory authorities, such as that, that FDIC, and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. So it's not just in Greenspan's realm that he just created this bubble. He's just one man. And as we all know, you know, one person can't make that much of a difference. So I think that that, that argument is a little bit flawed. Also, um, I want to kind of come back to what I was saying before, is that a lot of these foreign countries are sending their money, their currency, over to here. This has really played a huge role in propping up the credit bubble. Because they really rely on us to buy their goods. Because right now in Asia, you know, there's a lot of manufacturing going on there. And they, they, they need us to buy their goods, they need to be cheap. So they're sending their dollars over to, over to us so that we borrow. And when we borrow, we're using their money and we're buying their goods. So this is really a huge determinant that isn't really mentioned. And it's also a big reason why the credit bubble occurred. Um, also, Tulsa mentions that um, why are people borrowing so much? You know, it's not just low interest rates. There's structural issues here. What about the real wage not really going up for the past 30 years? So people have to take on more debt. That's also a pretty important thing. Greenspan doesn't control wages. So there's a lot of other things that are, that are going on. Um, also, what about the... Um, you know, people like to criticize Greenspan, but this is all hindsight. In 2001, 2002, 2003, you know, everybody was like, lower the interest rate, lower the interest rate, this is great, you know, we need, we need the economy to take off. And you didn't hear really much dissent then, but now everybody criticizes Greenspan, and, you know, it's, it's all in the past. And I think people need to realize is that he did this to help out the economy. He didn't necessarily, necessarily see what that was going to do. And he wasn't the only actor. Um, if you have good money going after good assets with good policies, then even if asset prices come down a little bit, that shouldn't lead to a collapse, right? If, if this money is flowing to people with good crediting ability, flowing to good houses, flowing to good businesses, then if something happens, some, some turbulence happens, that, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. But what the problem was, was outside Greenspan's realm, is that banks and people, there's a lot of fraud going on, there's a lot of people, a lot of speculation. He's not necessarily in control of that. So this, that, that's a huge part, is that you know, Greenspan can't, can't control the speculation, he can't control the, the bad practices. Jacob, as many others have argued, that Greenspan can only control so much in regards to financials and financial regulation. That deregulation was not just his doing. This is where I'd like to bring up a quote by a famous economist by the name of Andrew Beatles, who said that if finance was a religion, then Greenspan would be the Pope. Now, <laughs> last time I remember, the Pope is a pretty powerful figure. He has a lot of fear in his words. His speeches alone affected financial markets. So how can we assume that his actions cannot do the same, if not more? 
The chairman of the Federal Reserve is one of the most powerful figures in the world where hegemony is defined by GDP. And although it was against his beliefs, being in such a position a power must learn being in such a position of power, one must learn to adapt for the better of the economy. It's not always about your beliefs. At some point it has to be about financial sustainability. The, capa the, capacity, the capacity to regulate derivatives was definitely there, but as I mentioned before, they were constantly rebuffed by Greenspan. He constantly said that deregulation would be a problem and that, his, that the chances of a financial crisis arising from regulation were very slim. Well, that obviously wasn't true. This is where I like to say that there's a fine line between risk and rationality because he was a big advocate of risk. Um, uh, the other team mentioned how uh, fiscal policy and uh, specifically national debt being one of the problems and, and maybe my understanding is that one of the reasons why we're in this recession. I would like to argue that um, actually it was consumer debt that was increasing dramatically during Greenspan's tenure and it wasn't government debt. Government debt did increase, however consumer debt was a lot more than government debt. It increased, I believe, from 100% of the GDP to 300%, 350% of the GDP during Greenspan's tenure. The other point I want to make that I even if we take into account fiscal policy and government debt, uh, low, in the short run, these low interest rates probably make sense if you want if you're trying to start the economy and um, try to address the, the debt issue. However, in the long term, governments are just like consumers. You're just giving them an incentive to keep borrowing, pursuing their political agenda, uh, funding their wars, because interest rates are low. And my, my last point is that the Federal Reserve Bank was um, chartered by the Congress in 1913 as an independent institution. So it was supposed to, uh, the, the idea behind <coughs> that is that it's not affected by governmental business but it is actually uh, crafting policy that it's for the, for the uh, improvement of uh, society and us all. All right. I'll be addressing mostly the accusation that the reason why this is happening was Chinese savings. That's a pretty ridiculous concept because you have to realize that every dollar used, used to buy U.S. bonds did not suddenly burst into existence in China. Instead, they were printed by Greenspan's Federal Reserve thanks to his monetary policies. We've shown you the graphs. It wasn't exactly responsible. A lot of money was produced. And one of the effects that that has is that it pushes down the value of the dollar. And what do the Chinese want? They want their currency to not appreciate against the dollar. So the natural thing that they'll have to do then is to depreciate the yuan against the dollar. They do this by buying dollar-dominated assets, like, again, U.S. treasuries. This is not a Chinese policy. This is not a Chinese action as much as it's a reaction to Greenspan's own policies. You're arguing the circle trying to prove that Greenspan wasn't responsible for it because Greenspan obviously was. It's his policy that they were reacting to in the first place. Plus, I'd like to emphasize again and again, the Chinese cannot increase the amount of dollars in existence. There's no way that they can, and it's only by increasing the amount of dollars in existence that you would push down the interest rate. That is something that only the Federal Reserve can do. Plus, one last thing, if they're talking about a savings club, it would have been very nice to see some evidence, some, like some evidence, some graphs, some empirical proof. A savings club happening during Greenspan's tenure is not an a priori concept. You have to prove it. Thank you.
Alan, Alan Greenspan, obviously, he took part in some of I'll admit that much. <laughs> 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 but, but what I want to stress is that, is that it wasn't just his actions, it was many other people's actions that, that took part in this whole game. And Alan Greenspan simply sitting up on his chair, he's a signaler. He's not the, the he's not the doer. He's signaling to many to legions of banks and legions of, of financial institutions and banks and businesses what to do. But it's not his actions that necessarily create his credit card. It's a lot of people like the subprime mortgage lenders that had a lot of fraudulent practices that brought up prices in houses that created a bubble. Or it's also the, the Bernie Madoffs of the world who kind of created these fake financial instruments that were, that were kind of in the SEC's realm. That's not, that's not Greenspan's realm. And not only that, but it's, it's, it wasn't just him. You know, you, you can't say you know, you know, that he isn't to blame, but I think he's only a very small part of, of that equation. On the contrary, Alan Greenspan <laughs> is to blame for this crisis, and he had policies that very well might have stopped it from happening in the first place. First of all, his emphasis on deregulation, on greed, of being good for the markets, certainly didn't help it. This crisis stopped happening. He might have even prevented it somewhat. Plus, his low interest rates. He can set the, he can set the interest rates. It's not suddenly, you can't blame someone else for driving it so low when he is produced, pumping out money to drive even lower. And that money, in the end, will lead to malinvestments and overconsumption, as proven before, that will lead the way to a buzz, to a boom cycle that looks great, but will eventually lead to a bust cycle. It's great in the short run, but sadly, a lot of us tend to outlive the short run. And sadly enough, we must pay for that great time of an easy money orgy with a pain with a later bus cycle. Thank you. respond by um, just presenting a logic that Alan Greenspan created a culture on Wall Street. And this, on Wall Street, these are the mortgage banks that 
banks that lend mortgages. Um, Alan Greenson and constantly opposed regulation. He was always in favor of deregulation. And what this did was it heated up the market in home mortgages. Um, this, this led to more, com more competition between banks to attract new consumers to take out their, their particular mortgage entity. Were these mortgage banks under his um, Not directly. However, um, the culture that was created by him in this deregulation um, it heated up the market, which created competition. When they compete, they would lower their interest rates to, well, they would try to make their mortgages more attractive to consumers. And this is where subprime mortgages came in to try to attract a larger consumer base that wasn't pre existing. Um, the second largest department at the Federal Reserve Bank is the Department of Supervision, Regulation, and Credit. And they are supposed to work in close contact with the FHA. And they are supposed to work together to make sure that loans are, not loans, that consumers are protected. Um, that, and they fail to do this. And orders can come down from the top of the Federal Reserve to ask for better, better collaboration between this department at the Federal Reserve and the FHA. And to make sure that consumers are protected from these subprime mortgages and I have an inclination that Alan Greenspan did not push down any of these orders to make sure that consumers are protected from these bad mortgages that we're now dealing with. Well, so I'd also like to emphasize how the inflation of money into the economy will influence this because what the mor mortgages during the boom eras are make mortgage banks during the boom eras are making all these mortgages, the interest rate is low. They believe there's a lot of savings in the markets by which these will be supported. They'll be able to be paid off. However, this is all by a false pretense because of that driving down that interest rate. In fact, once the Fed slows down its inflation, once the interest rate rises, you see that the banks will then realize that the savings there that they thought was there, that they based all of their lending on, is not there. That is one of the reasons why you see the entire area, the entire all the mortgages coming collapsing quickly after these were mortgage rates were the interest rate was pushed up to have a artificial market condition created by the Federal Reserve that makes that creates an environment in which these type of mortgages thrive. <laughs> One quick point too. The, the um like Harrison noted, the the low interest rates spurred a lot of housing building. I, if you look at the construction of houses over the past 10 years, it's gone up until until recently. And with an excess of housing, you would expect the um, mortgages mortgages to try to be more favorable, try to sell more low, try to sell more houses, so you try to make mortgages more attractive to consumers. So in that way, you could say that he indirectly um, caused an overheating of the housing market. Would you like to respond to that? Yes. Um, I don't agree on when they said that it was competition um, that caused um, the lending from the banks for, for mortgages. It was more that the banks were getting, were making, you know, a kill off these fees um, for giving out mortgages, and that that's what really spurred more lending. And then on top of that, um, the repackaging of the mortgages. The rating agencies will rate these mortgages, with, you know, they'll rate them triple A's and they'll get these different tranches and there'll be different, different, um, you know, triple A's will, um, will be, will, will be the senior tranches and then there'll be the mezzanine or B's and then, and then um, the C's are called um, equity. And so they, after they rate that, they will take the mezzanine tranches, the B rated ratings, and they'll turn those and put a new rating and call the best of the B's and call them triple A's. And then the next one would be mezzanine, and then the, the next one after that would be equity. So then people would take these, you know, we'll look at, we'll look at the mezzanine ones, which are, which are B ratings, and buy them because they say triple A. In reality, they're really not. So they take a risk, which they don't know that they're taking. And, and that just, that, that also is not, that was also part of the reason why it ended up doing. One of the theories 
I've read recently is that actually what caused all this mess we're in is the price of gasoline. So I'd like to ask you whether you think France Greenspan has any influence on the price of gasoline and whether that really was a cause. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind it. I'd like to say that I, I don't believe that's true. I don't know if that helps my argument or not, but I think it does. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it does. I mean, it's, good to, it's, good to, it's good to discount the, the, the outlandish assumptions before you, you try to defend um, something more realistic. Um, gas prices, uh, to, to answer the second part of your question, the Federal Reserve has nothing at all to do with gas prices. Um, I learned this from experience when I tried uh, to use that as part of an argument uh, when I presented in front of the Federal Reserve. Um, the employees did not feel that the Federal Reserve should be concerned. Uh, is that all involved? Uh, uh, and and they, they, they don't with, with gas prices. Um, I feel like it is a, it's an integral part of our economy. It fuels every aspect of industry that we have. Uh, but when the, the gas prices are not historically high, um, uh, even before this recession, they, were, they had stabilized to, to something that was not as high as they had been uh, not two years ago or one year ago, but four, five years ago or four years ago. I don't know when they hit their peak, but it wasn't when this huge recession happened. That's a, the first indicator why they're not involved. Um, and also, this is such a, a systematic collapse that uh, if you if you look at the different in financial innovations that were going on, uh, and you really investigate into uh, the different lending practices that were happening prior to this recession, it becomes clear that it's more than a change in their commodities price that, that caused this, this recession. This is really... Um, something that's in the system rather than a variable within the system. It's actually the system itself that got out of control uh, and that was not uh, not fixed beforehand. So now the problems are making themselves apparent now. Believe it or not, I actually disagree with <laughs> <laughs> This is good. <laughs> and, um, I want to say that I, I guess if, if you look at the past recessions and you kind of look at the correlation, well, a lot of past recessions, the oil price spiked, right? So that's one huge correlation. As you know, if you look back in 74, if you look back at 81, if you look back at 91, it was all had some type of oil price spike in them. So it must be correlated. But also to go further than that, um, a large part of the consumer basket of goods is gas. It is oil. It's heating oil. It's, made, it's our energy. And if the price of oil goes up, that means the real wage goes down because those prices are going up. So that, that has an impact on, on what consumers can spend their money on. As well as where are those dollars going? <coughs> well, they're going to Saudi Arabia. They're going to Venezuela. They're going to um, you know, Kazakhstan. They're going to a whole bunch of big oil producing countries. And what are they doing with that money? They're sending it right back over here, kind of fueling the next round. Um, I would say cor correlation does not imply causation as a trite phrase, but I'd have to agree with Martin. Um, however, I agree with you. I do not think that gas prices uh, cause our current rec um, recession. And something that, no, well, that we haven't brought up in this debate at all, which I think is something important to bring up on our wages. Um, if you look at real wages, I don't know figures off the top of my head, but I don't know if anyone feels like their real wages have gone up over the past 10 or 20 years. And my inclination is that they have not. And Greenspan, well, he does have a lot of power in controlling wages. He testifies to Congress. His nickname was the Maestro. He had a lot of power. When he talked, this, when he spoke, the stock markets trembled, they said. Um, and Greenspan was not even in favor of a minimum wage. So we can't expect there to be favorable policies to wages, which would cause people to actually have income to buy goods. And they, didn't, they couldn't save, and their wages didn't go up, so they had to borrow. And they borrowed, and that, that's how I think Greenspan, I think he directly caused that by 
not looking at real wages and allowing people having a living wage so that they didn't have to borrow and didn't cause a credit crisis. And just to add to that, I think real wages haven't increased since the 70s. That's, that's what I learned. And um, again, to argue um, the whole idea of, of Greenspan's power, I, I think it was uh, enormous. I think a lot of times his power emerged from his articulation. Every time he spoke, most of the time, people didn't understand what he was saying. Therefore, they did not know how to oppose him, even if they wanted to oppose him. But I don't believe, I also agree with you, and it hurts your argument. I don't believe it was the oil prices that caused the recession, although I do believe that that can be a reason for future recessions if uh, the issue of, of this depleting resource now is not addressed. I definitely, I definitely agree with Jason. Um, because, because, I mean, I do agree that, that it, it was a contributor because, like you said, if you look at the, at, at, at the prices and the different recessions, they are co uh, correlated directly. And the fact that, like, for example, you have Saudi Arabia, um, when, the, when the prices are high, they, they're getting more revenue. Um, and the more money that they have, what do they do with it? And, it, you know, our economy before, before our recession is doing really well. Um, and and even further before a recession, our economy is actually picking up. So what do they do? They start investing in our in our economy. They buy buildings. They buy different things in our economy. And when when prices are so high that a bubble is about to burst, what do they do? They contribute to the bubble by selling off. So they're dumping. You know, they they're basically s selling off and getting getting their money back. And like. All, all that is not helping because there's a there's a there's a huge shift in where the money goes to at that time. And I don't know. I just I, just I don't think Saudi Arabia is a good example of money that they make from selling oil coming back here. I well, think they have very high unemployment, although they, they they store a lot of that revenue in their Swiss accounts or whatever and fancy buildings. But I think a lot of that money has to be spread out because their unemployment rates are. Enormous, and the only way for the king to maintain his power. He also sends some students abroad to study, and one student is here at UMass, and I know him. So if that's revenue coming from your oil consumption, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's substantial. Actually, they, they do send a lot of money here, and it's not just Saudi Arabia. It's Abu Dhabi. It's um, it's a lot of, you know Qatar. What they're doing is what he's talking about. Is they're setting up sovereign wealth funds. You can see the direct correlation in terms of the whole price of oil going up and the amount of money these sovereign wealth funds have to use, and their assets have increased tremendously. If you look at Abu Dhabi's, uh, they have about 10 sovereign wealth funds, but their main one, Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, um, you can see that their assets have basically tripled in the past 40 years. So that must have to do something with oil. And where are they buying? They're buying US and European corporations. They're buying buildings. They just bought the Chrysler building. They own 10% of Mercedes. They own you know tons of stuff. So they've, and also, but what else were they buying? They're buying banks. They are the backstop. And what does that mean? That means power. They have power over banks. Who's the largest shareholder? City Group. That's the the um, the guy that well, Saudi Arabia is one of them, and also Audi. You know, they own twenty percent of City Group together. That, that's that's a pretty big holding, and that that's that's really important. And you can't stress more is that they have power. They have they have all the funds. So that means that when when we're coming down. You know, when our assets are coming out, we're coming in trouble, they have a lot of say over policies. However, you're talking as if money just only comes into existence in these countries. Who controls the amount of money, U.S. dollars in existence? It's certainly not the Saudi Arabians or the Dubais. It's the Federal Reserve under Greenspan, and he did not control the amount of money in existence. He inflated and needed a lot more money to to existence. My, I quoted Ron Paul before, who said that in 2000, that he wasn't at all obeying the M3, M3 money supply aggregate demands of the Federal Reserve. In fact, he went over by it by around 200, let me stop this again. He went over it by 690 billion. This is not a Federal Reserve that is cautious about how much money is, is there is in, there is in existence, it's not cautious that the money goes overseas and comes back. Is not controlling the money supply, and you can't blame 
these Saudi Arabians were getting money and then sending it back here because that money was being returned by the Federal Reserve. It's not the Saudi Arabians, it's Green Sands Fed. Well, the I'll, I'll ask you a question. As the uh, real this group, so some of them slide with the gambling kind of analogy on it, correct, which kind of stuck in my head because you know, every business decision there is is a gamble. Right. It's a calculated risk. And you know, the, the presumption that greed is bad, right? It's unregulated greed that's bad, is it? It's not just greed is what makes the capitalist economy kind of go. Right? So the question really is when it comes to Greenspan, there's a difference between low interest rates, which is what he can control, and easy credit, which is what Congress deregulated in the, in the late 80s, right? So the, that, you know, so it wasn't it Congress's fault. That, they're the ones that deregulated all the, the banking rules that came out after the, after the Depression and created the atmosphere and the vehicles for the banks to create all these derivatives and all that kind of stuff that prior to that deregulation couldn't do. So it's kind of my question to you. Well, as I said before, when the analogy that, the analogy that I put up about someone betting or not, you win your next hand in blackjack, is a risk that we take and in a capitalist market, obviously, you know, there's always risk. So by taking these risks, it was grabbing all the, the like we could use um, all the, it was pretty much spreading it throughout. So as when we talked about the, the gradings, the triple A's, it, it made it more appealing than it really was. So when they failed, it wasn't, it wasn't so much that it went to just one specific place that it failed. So when it failed, so many other places failed because the risk was spread out through the, the mortgage-backed securities and the, the other things like that where they were betting, pretty much betting on whether or not they were going to fail. And I would say Congress, Congress deregulated, um, that is true, but I would put blame on Greenspan still. Greenspan sat in front of Congress and continued and stuck to his guns about how he felt about deregulation, which, um, flawed or not, we can debate that another day. Um, but the fact is, Congress Congress listened to Greenspan. Congress still listens to the Fed Chairman. Um, Fed Chairman is one of the most powerful powerful figures in the world. Um, I I was working with my uncle, and I think I was maybe fourteen or something. I didn't really know anything about economics or much. And he asked me, um, who, who's the most powerful man in the world? And um, I said, I don't know, President of the United States? Well, probably not. He told me it was Alan Greenspan. And I that stuck with me. I I mean, he's he had so much power. He said two words, and the Tokyo Stock Exchange drops him into another. Um, his irrational exuberant speech, which is infamous. Um, so I would put a lot of blame on him still for for continuous, continuing to tell Congress that deregulation is the way to go to have a stable economy. Yeah. Uh, question for you guys. So, you know, Greenspan for a generation was held up as the genius, right? He was, you know, took all the accolades for, you know, for driving the economy. Doesn't he deserve some of the blame when it goes up? I mean, you can't take all the credit and then not take all the blame, right? Isn't that the old action? You know, that, just, that just seems so obvious. Except when that's what I get a quote, right? It's totally I mean, like you said, he did take some of the blame. He said that his, 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 um, his free market beliefs were flawed. Um, so he does take that blame. However, it's, you know, is he completely to blame? <laughs> yeah, I would I would say he is he's more responsible for the success than he was for the failure. So I, I can say <laughs> I would say that I'd say that different amounts of blame can be attributed to different factors. And I, I would say that there are all these innovations being made in the early nineties and, and late eighties in the financial markets that they were, uh, they were inventions that hadn't been tested out yet. Um, nobody knew what they would really do in the long run. Um, we were talking about uh, the Clinton administration's policy that you have uh, one home for every individual. 
um, the consequences of that uh, were not properly uh, researched. And people hadn't anticipated the, the consequences of, of giving people these, these loans that were easy to get and, and not investigating their ability to pay them off. Um, I would say that he was, Alan Greenspan was given a lot of the credit for the economy succeeding over the um, 1991 to 2001 uh, expansion. Um, but during this expansion, all these different variables were being introduced into the market, these externalities. Externalities outside of the Federal Reserve's influence. So I would say there's sort of a, there was a, a change in the culture of, of our economy that um, brought the control of, of, of uh, success and failure uh, more out of the Federal Reserve's hands and into the hands of irresponsible investors and lenders. Um, and this uh, debt and this credit and these hazardous, hazardous uh, investments gained in size without anyone uh, regulating them or observing this uh, or being aware of it, uh, including the Fed, because it wasn't really traditionally their job to look over the financial uh, uh, trades that were going on between corporations. And so I would say, yeah, you can, you can attribute more success to Greenspan than you can failure in this case, because it was in the, it was in the late end of his tenure when these innovations and these different machinations were, were occurring. Um, that brought about this recession. And I mean, and if you look at it during Walker's time, you had high inflation rates, high unemployment rates, and then when he came in, well, you know, what was the results? Low unemployment rates, low inflation rates. I mean, what's bad about all that? You know, all, all that stuff that he did. Um, right now, unemployment is at what? Eight, eight percent or something like that? And it, it, it was around that, you know, around that, um, that percentage when Walker was coming out, and then you know he brought it low, and, and it stopped low for a while until currently. And like you said, those externalities that were in it, I, I also I agree with them. I believe those were definitely a factor. Great job. Can we have two folks? <laughs> I don't know. Um, we, I, I guess, I think I think it's often said that we put on too much too much blame for people's mistakes and give them too much credit for their successes. I think this is a really classic textbook case of this, is that people were saying, oh, Greenspan did a great, great job. But really, I think there's a lot of other things going on other than Greenspan. And then when things crash, everybody blamed it on them. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think he got way too much blame for, for what his share was. So what should we have done to prevent this? Um, well, I, I, yeah. 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 Not keep interest low for too long. Just that, not ignore that. I also, I also think that the, f the reason why they blame him so much is because he had this almost prophetic figure. If he was just He's another, yeah. If he was just another, yeah. that German, I think that would be a, I don't know, somewhat expected. But because he had this very big figure. It was disappointing. It's like, again, the Pope analogy. Why isn't this just part of the normal cycle? You know, I mean, recessions happen. If there is a boom and a bust, right? I mean, that's the cycles we all learned in school when we were here, too, right? So why isn't this just, I know that we haven't had a recession really of any significance since the 70s. Really, the ones in the 80s were pretty mild. Uh, so, <laughs> right? Recessions so, are pretty mild. So, so why isn't this just a recession that's just a you know, bad recession? We had 25 years of pretty pretty high prosperity. Granted, you know, not everybody shared that prosperity, but there was a lot of wealth generated in this country for a number of years. I think that, that answer, I mean, to answer that question, I think it takes a while. I think it's, it's complex. But the first thing that comes to my mind is that, again, this is international, and I think that's why the magnitude of this recession is so big. So maybe it does resemble the Great Depression and not the 70s. You can compare it to the Great Depression, maybe, because it is international, and we're seeing it every day. So that's one aspect of it. To address that, one reason why this recession is very important is that we have the theories to explain it. 
Low interest rates caused a skewing of structured production that resulted in a recession. Now, it's just a business cycle that normally in, is in capitalism. It's a business cycle that is caused by the actions of Greenspan in the Federal Reserve. Yeah, I'd say we do have business cycles. They, they go up, they go down, but they are on a, a, a general upward trend. That's what we, we learned in Macro 104. And this one, though, was up. And it, the, the Fed is supposed to, to implement policies on the upswing to make that sustain and make sure that it doesn't just go straight up. Um, make sure that, yeah, the old, yeah, what goes up must come down. Um, but you're, the, the Fed knows that, and they're trying to make sure that what goes up stays up for as long as possible. But if it has to come down, that it doesn't crash, that it comes down to a point that's... that's Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, our friends over here continue to talk about interest rates, so I would ask you a what if question. What if Greenspan had decided to gradually increase interest rates? Do you think that would have stopped this recession? Um, um, like, when, when would, are we talking about? Would, we, would you say you gradually increase interest rates from? For you. Uh, well, the, the decision was made to gradually increase interest rates uh, about four years ago. Um, and I would argue that at that point in time, um, it was difficult to raise them any earlier than, than that point. Um, like I said in my argument, um, you know, the memory of September 11th was still fresh in our heads. The Federal Reserve had to do things that were completely unprecedented in their history. Um, they had to, to prevent a, a, a lending freeze uh, among banks. Um, they had uh, the, the threat of a, of a recession already placed on them. Uh, then there's this huge influx of uh, government spending from uh, financing wars, uh, uh, borrowings out of control. So, they really had to keep interest rates low over that period. And if they had raised them earlier, um, we might not have even seen the amount of expansion we did. Um, and we could be experiencing this recession earlier. Because it, uh, even if you were raising the interest rates gradually over that period of time, you still had this crisis in the in home mortgages that was going on underneath the surface. Um, and interest rates wouldn't change what was happening within that uh, home loan crisis. Okay. <coughs> this is one of the traditions of our debate series. And this graphic was generated by the debate team members. <laughs> <laughs> so, all of the debate team members and the judges will get their t-shirt. So thank you all, it was a really good time.